Hello there. I hope you're well. I am Hiramone and welcome to Get Set Global. Wish you all a very happy new year. So how do we start the new year? Whatever we do, whatever we set out to do, um, the end goal is always to be happy, right? But how do we get there when life throws so much at us? If I talk about last year, 2020 came as a shock to most. And if not everyone, but most people are going through their share of concerns, whether it's to do with loneliness or sense of a sense of insecurity, uncertainty, financial issues, health issues. So one, when all of that is going on, how do we keep ourselves centered and reach out to our consciousness and kind of know that all of that is within our reach, the tools that brings us joy, peace and happiness, whichever word really resonates with you. I feel privileged to have a panel in my show today uh, who have traveled the road, um, who have observed the nuances deeply and have been guiding people to lead a more meaningful life filled with joy. Um, so today's show is not just about learning, but it's about transformation. And it is my absolute honor to invite my panel of guests for today's show. So my first guest is uh, Reverend Garrett Milliken, and he's a monk in the Soto Zen tradition. Hi, Garrett. Hello, hello. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Um, and, and so, like I said, uh, Reverend Garrett Milliken, he is uh, he's a monk in the Soto Zen tradition. Uh, he's also a senior member of the uh, Order of Buddhist Contemplative, and he has been a monk for 22 years. Uh, my next guest is Mahmoud Mustafa. And... Uh, Hello, Bermud. Hi. Hi. Happy New Year. Thank you for and ha To you as well, to you as well. And thank you so much for being a part of this show. Um, so Mahmoud, <laughs> Mahmoud is, uh, calls himself a student of Sufism. Uh, he has been following the path of Sufi path for 25 years. He has done public speeches in different parts of the world and he has written many uh, articles and a book as well around the philosophies around Sufism. So we'll have a lot to talk about. And my final guest is Wasim Hogg. Hi, Wasim. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, so Wasim um, is an IT professional. Uh, he is a meditation practitioner. He's from Dibrugor in Assam. And when I asked him, how should I introduce you, Wasim? He said, uh, yeah, IT professional, meditation practitioner, and probably something else. So I'm very keen to explore that something else bit as well during the show. Oh, um, no. I said, whatever <laughs> you like, it, it, just, uh, what should yeah. you do, you know, just this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think what I like is that you don't, identify with any of it. So that's fantastic. But uh, true, Wasim will get to know how his practice meditation has helped him improve both his professional as well as personal life. But uh, thank you to each one of you. Um, so let me start with Garrett. Um, Garrett, the practice that you follow, I think is called serene reflection meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I mean, if I just put it in the most simplistic way, probably this ultimately these are designed to help people to feel better. Um, you will explain more, of course. But if I talk about happiness, um, I mean, everybody wants to be happy, right? Um, mm. But it almost feels like a chase. Uh, so I really want you to almost deconstruct the word happiness. And um, um, do we need to improve our understanding of happiness. Uh, so yeah, so how do we get there? How do we feel happy every day? Well, I think when you say it's a chase, it um, goes right to the nub of it. Because if we, happiness, I think, is fleeting. And it, it, it usually, for me, it's attached to a thing or something. 
And so I prefer to talk about contentment, which is based in a deeper um, refuge, if you like. It can always be there. I think it's happiness is fine. I'm, I love being happy. When I'm happy, I'm having a good day and I'm happy, then it's lovely. But I know it's going to pass. What happens when it passes? And so do we bounce from happiness to misery back to happiness? So I think it's, it's better to let go of the idea of happiness, of trying to chase happiness and just be with whatever arises in your life. And you can be content with that, whether it's um, being anxious about coming on to this program um, or, you know, something's happening or you get you get an email, a surprising email. There might be a slight shock. You might have a slight anxiety or fear. But one can be with that in such a way as it doesn't disturb your equilibrium. Um, so I think happiness, unfortunately for me, is it's not quite the right word, but I know what you mean. <laughs> so yeah. is, is the contentment the right word you are saying? So if for me, yes, yes. Okay. So if that's the case, how because like you have said, whether to come into the show or getting an email which is not mm -hmm. so um favorable mm -hmm. how do you how do you make yourself controlled i like how do you put yourself in a state of mind that it doesn't really bother you have you got some yeah. some advice on that well I, I think it is a matter of um having a practice of some sort which i and um, and was in follows the same practice as me um that is very much to do with um, knowing that all things are impermanent, that whatever arises will pass. And when we can live from that place, when we can live from a place that we know it doesn't really matter, it's just something arising and we can be with it and let it pass. And when it passes, then we can actually deal with it in a much better way. And I think that is what we're talking about today, that we can see things um, not lopsidedly, i.e. from a one-sided point of view of whether that is fear or whether it's the opposite to fear. It's something in the middle which we can ground ourselves in and then move forward um, without being shaken from our, where we're standing, if you like. Does that, if that makes sense? We're, we, we know where we are and we're not suddenly driven to do something because mm. something's it's telling us to do so. Our mind doesn't drive ourselves somewhere else. We can actually keep coming back to where we are. Mm, yeah, that is yeah. The basis of contentment. Sure. So, of course, you have also said that to do that, I think certain kind of practice definitely mm. helps. Mm. Um, so is it almost okay to say that emotions on its own, they don't affect us, whether it's happiness, sadness or anger? But mm. the thought, it are thoughts that would form these emotions and these practices almost help you to control your thoughts so you're able to distinguish that my thoughts do not have to do anything with the emotions. Is it yeah. okay to say um, that? Yes, it's, it's, more, it's more that you see through the thought, you see what's happening. So whether it's an emotion or a thought um, or a reaction of any kind, at the very moment that it arises, through having an established a practice and you do it on a regular basis, this is what helps it to bring it into your life, is that any moment you're prepared, or in a sense you know that this thing is just an arising phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and, and of course there's gradations of that. Um, a death of a partner would be on one level and a slight irritation is down on the other. So I'm not saying they're all the same. But nevertheless, whatever arises for us, i.e. something happens, um, a thought arises in our mind that we don't like this, mm -hmm. rather than being driven by that thought to either run away or do something destructive to ourselves or others, we just recognize that beneath all of that, this is just ephemeral stuff. Now, what is important is that what, what springs from that. Yes, yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. I'll have more to talk on mm. that, Garrett, but uh, my next question is for Mahmoud. Um, and Mahmoud, 
obviously because we are talking about okay am i yeah perfect um so because we are talking about happiness so this question is an extension of that so interestingly we would see that people when things seem to be going fine in their lives we still worry we worry worrying that what we have we shouldn't lose or worrying about the future has nobody has seen what that lies for us um so clearly going everything fine doesn't necessarily mean that we will feel better so i want to know from you if you could untangle that for us why so and what do we need to do yes thank you um I agree very much with what Reverend Gareth said about contentment. And I was, I was going to say that, so I don't need to say that anymore because he, he hit the nail on the head. Um, well, and you know, most of us, when we live our lives from um, a place of our ego instead of the heart or spirit. And the ego's structure is one that is bound up in fear of pain and desire for pleasure. And that kind of rules our lives. We live in this habitual um, cycle of, of wanting to avoid pain and seeking pleasure and then making ourselves dependent on what happens. You know, if, if, we're, if things go the way we want, we're happy. If they don't, we're not happy and we're angry and we're blaming or whatever, whatever our habit is. And so it's, there's no escape from that as long as we're still living from the center of the ego, which, which to, quite simply put is, I think I am the center of the universe. And I think everything happens because of me, for me, and to me. And that's a very, you know, very self-centered way of looking at life. And it's, it's bound to make us miserable. And it's bound to make the people around us miserable because as the reverend said nothing is permanent everything change is the nature of life but the ego doesn't want change it especially change that it perceives as painful or not what i like you know i, I want things to be always what i like and never change and this and it, it's really a false the false continuity of self we live our lives imagining that we don't change, that I'm the same person yesterday that I that I am today and will be tomorrow, and that's a that's a a, a myth, a falsehood. You know, we, we're never the same person. You know, if I think back on my life, you know, I'm not the same now as I was when I was a child or when I was a a young man. Or you know, things are constantly changing by the minute. We just don't perceive it. So, so the key is to live, shift our center from my ego to a, a higher place, a more, a deeper, more profound, more authentic place. And in, in the Sufi teachings, the Sufi guidance, that place is to know that I am in a relationship with something called my essential self, which is within me. And what what in in religious terms would be the lord or god right? and that 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 is within me it, it guides me it nourishes me it it you know whatever happens is a relationship between me and that essential self and that can so i want to add. yeah sure so what i want to know so if somebody let's say doesn't quite believe in god you will know people who couldn't uh it is still possible to find that something isn't it that to create that relationship between yes. something and you yes it's it's your inner light you can think of it in many ways you know in, in our tradition we say it's it's the divine light the divine yeah. our essential source what what makes us alive you know mm -hmm. the truth is i'm alive that's that i'm living and i'm living in this relationship and that relationship can guide me. It can, it, it you know, it can shift me from the place of what I want and don't want to the place of being grateful, being in wonder, 
being joyful at whatever comes to me, you know, being able to withstand the difficulties because I live in a place of trust and knowing that I'm held in an ocean of love, that, that underlying everything there is, there is a love that, that acts with benevolence and goodness towards us eventually, you know. We can eventually see that if we live in it. And, and it's not, you know, in, in the practice of Sufism, we, we concentrate on something called presence, which is basically to be a witness to life and myself instead of being identified with it. And so if I'm aware of my thoughts and emotions and behaviors, I have a choice. I don't have to be driven by them and enslaved by them. I can choose a better way of being if I'm in presence. So is it then right to say, of course, you have spoken about ego. I'll come to that later on a bit more. Um, so when it's about I, I, me, it's so self-centered, that's probably one way of keeping unhappy. But the other thing we have also said that unless you know yourself, uh, who you are, what you want, it's just quite difficult to keep an emotional balance. Would you say that as well? Because you're all over the place. Everything you like or everything affects you. And that chase that we spoke about, do you think it is also because of that, that because we have not invested time to actually really know us and what we want from life? I would say, um, I would put it in a slightly different way. It's, it's because we don't know who we really are. We imagine that we are made up of these complexes of habits and conditioning. And so I live my life thinking, I'll be happy if I have a bigger house. If I have, you know, uh, in the case of me, because I'm a man, a beautiful woman at my side, you know, I'll be happy if I have money. I'll be happy because these are all things that have been told. I've been told that's what's going to make you happy. And but I don't know really what happiness is or who I am, and and so it's I'm always you know these are conditionings around pain and pleasure, you know? always seek pleasure and always run away from pain. But that's not a real life. It's an it's an imaginary life that doesn't exist anywhere in reality. You know, life the reality of life is it's you know it's it's a cycle. Nothing stays the same. You know. And so it's really not knowing who I am and not realizing that I am more than just my possessions or what people think of me or what I think of myself. Mm -hmm. I like when you said how we run away from pain because we're trained to run away from pain like plague, aren't we? So <laughs> I think that creates problem. But uh, and often, often pain is what teaches us the most and the makes us most human. It, it teaches yes. us to be compassionate, it, it deepens our love. I mean, mm. it can, it can also make us very alienated. But if, if we're in the right state of being, it can, it, that's what helps us understand and learn and be better human beings. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so I, my next question is for Wasim. Um, so Wasim, uh, let me unmute you. Okay. Um, so, like I said before, you're an IT professional, a practitioner of meditation as well. But um, before that, like you were in the middle of the corporate you know, world where it's all about productivity and you know, showing results, making profits. You still do all of that. Um, and you have a lovely family as well. You are a wife and two sons. Um, so... A couple of years back, I'm hoping that probably there was a time when you wanted to change something in your life, how you had been leading your life, um, which may not be right or wrong, but you got into different practices like meditation and so on. So I want to know what made you make those changes. And since then, what sort of changes have you been making in your life? All right. Okay. Uh, so... Probably, I don't know, probably from my childhood, um, there is a tendency to be with the silence because I brought up in a very quiet environment. And uh, maybe uh, before that, because my father was also very calm and quiet. And uh, But uh, I went to the universities and all happens and you, know, you have to uh, do something in life, you have to show things. And, and I, with the 
as as Mahmoud says, so the society uh, made me to do things as they think it is correct, and 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 I went on and on the university. So um, at that time it was nineties, early nineties, and I got into something called Hare Krishna movement and for a very short period of time, one and two months, and towards the end when I was them. And I found a very profound space within me and very, very peaceful. But it was after two months and then I also get into the same habits and that 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 thing is left. But that profoundness, that space is always there. I thought it, it was there, but it's not there anymore now. And probably, I don't know, probably I was looking for that um, in the external world, you know, in a job, in a relationship. And I live in seven different countries and um, changing job, careers, and came to UK from Debrug. <laughs> uh, and what happened in uh, very recently, in 2015, um, uh, we changed house, uh, moved to a bigger house. Um, I thought, oh, yeah, this is it. This is the one, the nice place I want. I uh, got, a, got a bigger car, it was a smaller car, I got a bigger car, <laughs> um, uh, got a promotion. Uh, so everything is is there, but still still looking for. And very peculiar thing, because I have, because I sold my house, so I have some excess money. So I used to buy what you call man's toy, you know. I bought a tab radio. Ah, this will, this is it. Uh, I'll get it there. And then I bought an electric saver. Uh, ah, this, this will, <laughs> this, this is <laughs> And then I know, no, probably this is not correct. And somehow near my office, um, I bought a book of mindfulness. Uh, there's a tri Trinetra Buddhist Center and bought a book of mindfulness. And then I uh, I did it mindful. I sit, then they take you to eight weeks. And then things probably started to open up. I think I was looking into something wrong. I'm looking at the outside world. And I then Google what's the nearest place near me to sit and then find Reverend Garrett's temple. And I started going there, and when I just sit and observe my thoughts, and things started to open up, um, then I look at a different tradition. I've been to Mohammed's uh, Sufi circle thrice, four, four times. It is quite far, so it's difficult to go. Uh, I, but when I go there, I find that the deep within me, that space where everything doesn't matter, that stillness, is same in different traditions. And, and that, I think, as Mama said, that ego started to break up slowly. And then the whole relationship with me and the world started to change. Earlier it was me, my ego. I have to satisfy that. I have to be always right. I used to read seven different newspapers, all economics and everything, so that I could be right on the dinner table, always right. You know? In a job, all my colleagues used to be my competitors. I have to beat them to get promotion. That relationship start changing, and and it, it, that ego become more about compassionate. So, in, in in the corporate world, my colleague become I can see why he is struggling. I can see his suffering. I can relate his suffering with my suffering, and that brings lots of compassion. So, whole relationship with the colleagues change. They're no longer my competitors now. They're my friend, and they become very good friend. Same thing happens um, within the family. I used to have an idea. I used to see the world from my ideas. What about the right? And when the ideas doesn't meet, you know, then 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 it was always stressful. And then that ideas, you know, when I say it is just an idea, it's a concept. It's not the reality. Reality is so much deep within everything. Mars. It, it's so so entire relationship with my family. With the colleagues, Arya used to say, this is my life and this is my work. Different. Stressful. When I go to the work, oh, this is not my life, this is work. Uh, that that loosen up and everything has become life. And this life is flowing. It's impermanent, coming. And I have to accept life with my open hand. This is what it is. And that, that opens up the whole thing. And when I said in meditation, I, I do see it. But one thing is very important, becoming very important for me. I don't sit in meditation. The, the entire world sits with me. See, uh, without the support of my family, I would not be able to sit without their cooperation. Without this place to sit, I will not be able to sit. 
without the art below me, I was not able to sit. Without the sun, moon, and the wind, I was not able to sit. So the whole universe come together and probably sit with me. And when you feel that, you are the part of something bigger. And that will give you directions. And nobody told me to don't not to eat meat uh, when I start sitting. <laughs> I stop eating meat. I can't kill animals. I, I, I feel their pain, seriously their pain coming up in my in my plate. I can see their suffering. So it yeah. changed in a very profound way, the way I looked into it. Uh, mm. And probably when I start with it started to get rid of my stress, I want to be happy when I start sitting, you know. And then yeah. It opens up, and I also been to a couple of times Vedanta Society. Uh, and, um, I, I start reading all the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita's and Qurans and all the Buddhists. All point to lead to something very profound, which is probably deep within us. And when we sit and let go of our ego, our thinking mind, our ideas and notions, things started to open up. Mm. And when this open up. Whole things change. I love, I absolutely love what you are saying. Um, I really love this because um, when you have said that, you know, you gained your qualification, you got to a good job and great salary, bigger house, you know, families, children, bigger car. And then you look back and say, none of this actually made me happy that I was after. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. This thing yeah. I don't feel, I'm not saying, but it's not, it just need to sustain life. It doesn't need That's to be bigger and better all the time. It doesn't, yeah. And that's where your search started. I mean, one of these really well-known pop singers, I wouldn't say the name, and he said, I know that if I release my next album, my next song tomorrow and becomes the biggest hit, that's not going to make me happy. That's my job. You know, that's my work that I do, but to be happy or contentment, as Gareth said, I have to keep doing that inner work that you talked about, compassion and feeling that you're one with the universe and all of that. So I think it's so good to hear all of that coming from you. Uh, but I'll have a lot more to talk about, about your professional life as well. Yeah. Um, so coming to Gareth. Um, so... Uh, Wasim has just quickly touched upon stress. He did say, you know, probably it comes from some a place like where you're stressed and stuff like that. And in today's world, I mean, most people are probably suffering from it. It's almost like a buzzword. Uh, so I want to know from you where you think this, this stress come from um, and are there ways, practical ways that can be achieved um, and we can reduce or at least manage our stress and anxiety? What would you say? Okay. Um, if we're not talking about clinical anxiety and things like that, I'm, I'm sticking to more um, the stress of everyday life rather than someone who has a condition because I'm not a doctor. Um, but I think really if we, if, uh, to keep it in a nutshell, so to speak, or we need to look at the aspect of life where, which what Wazim has touched on, where we um, want some, we attach ourselves to ideas or things or a sense of self. We, as the Buddha said in the Four Noble Truths, that suffering, there is suffering in the world, that's a given. And, but we suffer because we're attached. And that is where we need. To look and then the next step from that is well how do we how do we do that of course um, but it is important to originally recognize that my stress and anxiety comes through a false ultimately a false sense of feeling that if I hold on to something if I hold on to my view my world view if I hold on to my attachment to something or somebody um, then I will inevitably suffer and so the next question someone would ask me then well how can I be married how can I have a partner how can I look after my children the two it does mean that you can um, do all of these things it's just that you have to look at what is it 
that you're attached to. And so it's not that you throw everything out. None of this is about rejecting or getting rid of. It's actually coming into line with one's life comes into line with what is good to do, as we say in Buddhism. Um, and so as a monk, I found that by cutting the root um, of my attachment to my family, we actually became much closer. And many people think, well, actually, you're just shutting the door in their face and saying goodbye. That's not the case. You're actually cutting the root to the suffering that attaches you to your idea of what the family is or your idea of your relationship to them. When you can cut that, then everything frees up and you actually give, and space is a very good word here, you give space to others, which I don't think we probably did before. We didn't realize we were doing it. None of this is done um, through willfulness. It's just ignorance to actually what's going on. And so when you can cut that root of suffering to anything, um, then you're much more liberated to walk around in the world much more freely because it doesn't matter if they're there or not because you're not actually holding on to something. As we all know, if you really hold on to something and you get the white knuckles and you get the, the pain in your arm, just have to do that for a moment to realize how difficult that is to sustain. We just have to let it all go. And what opens up in front of us is a much more truthful and yes, compassionate and wise um, relationship to everything. So it's our relationship to the world that changes. We don't need to change the world. We just need to change the relationship we have to the world. And I found that through meditation. Um, there's other ways of doing it, but I found one that seemed to suit my own particular history and karma, if you want to put it that way. It sort of just fitted like a hand in a glove. And I went with that. I didn't need to look anywhere else. Um, and and we have, you know, I follow a particular form and I stick to it. Um, but I say there's many other ways. But what that taught me was that I don't even need to hold on to an idea of spirituality or Buddhism or anything. I don't have to hold on to the practice. I just let everything go the best I can. And um, and do that moment to moment. So is it almost like saying what a lot of people say, living in the moment, but then it must be very hard to live in the moment because you like said, the meditation practice, even that you feel when you religiously follow it, it you're attached to it. So you let that go as well. Mm -hmm. So to come to that terms, is it almost like living there every second and otherwise let other things go? I'd never claim anything for myself that I'm living a moment to moment exactly. <laughs> so that's still just an idea. Yeah. I think yeah. it's important <laughs> to give ourselves a bit of slack in the sense that we're doing the best we can at any one time. But what's important to notice is when we go off that, when we, we step back, we're actually in a position to recognize that's what we've done. And I think um, when we don't have something like a practice, then the mind can rule us in the sense that we'll start to believe things because we tell ourselves they're true. And I think the value of a practice is that actually when you do step sideways or backways or um, sort of do something maybe or say something even under stress that you know you wish you hadn't said, um, you recognize that you've done so rather than rationalize it and saying, well, I was justified in doing so. You actually rec you feel it in your body anyway. You feel it intensely. And, and that's what you just, that's what I mean from moment to moment. I don't mean there's an intense, every moment is separated from the rest of the world. It's not. It's just what arises in this moment is what I need to do. What is there for me to do now? Well, at the moment, it's talking to you on your 
program. If I start to think about what I'm going to do after this, then I'm lost. That's moment to moment. It's not an it's not a sort of um, uh, a fascist sort of. If you're not in the moment, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, you know, how dare you not be in the moment? It's more a recognition that um, you just give attention to what is there to do for you, and then you actually start to see what it is you need to do, mm. rather than tell yourself what you think you should be doing. Mm. And yeah. That is much more of a um, kinder way to behave to yourself and to others. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Um, even, you know, when you were saying what we say to ourselves, I have seen in my own life, um, nothing has affected my stress level more than what I tell myself. So, mm. for example, if I say, this has been such a busy week for me. It's almost exhausting. It is self-pity. But mm -hmm. when I change to saying that this has been a very productive week for me, it's almost re-energizing and almost mm -hmm. I feel good about what I have done. So mm -hmm. I almost sometimes feel that the words, you know, we have to be quite mindful what we're using for ourselves, for others. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yes. Maybe we'll look back at uh, the year we're, we're just, as you know, we might obviously we're just coming out of this year and um, and and looking forward a certain in a certain way to what's to come. Although of course we don't know what that is. If you look back and and then start to quantify whether you've had a good or a bad year, I think it's slightly missing the point. It's it was the year it was, and we did what we could within it. Um, to then quantify it as a bad year against a better year, we're already conceptualizing in our minds what is good and bad, what is high and low. Um, we may reflect and say, well, I could have done that a bit better. I could have responded to that person who was wanting help. Fine, we could have done. We just re recognize that and we then walk on knowing that, okay, then we, we've seen that. So it really is a case of, for me, is to not get into um, a real uh, fuss about all the things I did wrong and all the things I did right. It's just saying, well, the next moment presents itself. Do I recognize that or do I not? And that for me allows when we talk about stress that does take the stress out of living because a lot of these things aren't in your control and, and to an ultimate extent nothing is in your control um, and when you recognize that a lot of the um, self berating or berating of others falls away because it's not actually um, it's not actually there anymore to be for that to happen. It's sort of it's not a possibility because as soon as you recognize you're doing it, you come back to where you are and it goes. And this is what we teach in meditation is that when you're meditating and your mind is all stopped, you start to project forward or remember. As soon as you realize you're doing that, you're already meditating again, you've, you've come back. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to force yourself to do anything. You don't need to contort yourself to do anything. You're already back, purely yeah. by recognizing and letting it go. Wonderful, fantastic, Garrett. Now, my next question is for Mahmoud. And now that we are, Garrett has set up this whole meditation thing pretty well, but I want to know from you, Mahmoud, how, what is the role of meditation? Because I can tell that all of you have been practicing meditation and you must have found uh, the positive sides of it. So yeah, if you can just tell us what is it that it is going to do in people's life and also some of the probably basic things that people can do wherever they are, you know, the most simple way. Well, one of the principles of Sufi teachings is that 
by our nature, because we're human beings, we tend to be forgetful. And so our, we have other qualities too that, that make us human, but this is one of the qualities that we try to understand and be aware of, is that we tend to be forgetful. And our practice is called remembering. Not meaning remembering the past, but remembering that I have this inner essential self and that I'm in that relationship, that I am much, much greater than just my outer form and the sum of my experiences and the things I've been taught and the things that I own. There's something much greater and to try to remember that. And the, the, the Sufi practice of meditation is called to remember. And it's basically to learn to develop this capacity of presence that I mentioned before, of witnessing ourselves and witnessing life. It's not, it's not a performance. Often we, we come to all of these things thinking I have to perform, I have to do it right, you know? I, I have to be really good at meditating. And this is just the same repetitive pattern of ego, you know, wanting to accumulate. And really the, the act of meditation or, or any, any authentic spiritual practice really has to do with letting go of things, of giving things up instead of accumulating more and more. And, you know, meditation in a way does that. It helps us lay aside a lot of our complexes and a lot of our conditioning and just learn to be instead of do. Just learn to be with what is. Because a, a lot of our stress and things like this is because we're, without, whether we know it or not, we're frequently objecting to life. We're always saying, why is it this way? I wish it could be this way. I, you know, we're constantly objecting. Right? And to surrender is to say yes, to say yes to life. To, to embrace it, to embrace whatever we're in at, uh, you know, at the moment. This is an overused term, but just to be aware of it. You know? And as, as Garrett said, it's not, you know, it's, it's a fantasy to say, I'm, I'm always in the moment. You know, that's, <laughs> no, nobody's ever like this. You know? But to remember and come back, that there's always a way back. And Meditation just builds this capacity of self-awareness, of realization that, in our tradition, realization that I am in a relationship of love. Because love is what breaks down our objections. It breaks down our defenses. It can bring healing to our hearts and acceptance of ourselves. And I'm not talking about romantic love or sentimental love or any of the things that have come to mean love in our culture. But it's, it's the love that is possible within me, that it's a relationship that I have with my greater self. And that's not something easy to develop. We can talk about it, but to, to learn that we ourselves are that love is a life's work, maybe many life's work. You know? But that's really what matters, because that's what can bring us into authenticity with the world with others, with relationships, we become more truthful, more authentic, more loving. If we know that we are that love, it's within us. It's not something I'm going to acquire. I'm going to learn how to love. No, it's something in me that I can let come out and be part of this world to, for myself and the people around. And to us, to, I mean, to us, meditation is about that. Is how do I get to that state of being more human, of reflecting this divine light that's in me? It, it, it's, not, it's not a you know, and it requires detachment. It requires laying down of things. It's a it's a successive process over and over again of of letting go, of peeling away layer by layer of the things that keep us from knowing this truth about ourselves. So. Um I mean, I think I totally do understand it's the benefits of meditation and you have really explained it well. Now, we spoke about this before the show as well, that there is a general understanding that 
meditation requires time. It's for people who have time, who are not in the middle of the hustle bustle of you know professional life. So, but then now it's been proven that you know meditation and all this philosophies derived from let's say spirituality can be hugely beneficial for businesses, startups, professional lives. So can you just talk a little bit more about that side, how that is helpful? Well, like Wasim, I I also lived part of, a big part of my life in the technology world and I had a big career in technology companies. And my first 10 years on the Sufi path were in that milieu of being in a big corporate world. And I learned because of this practice, because of the guidance of, of the Sufi path, to bring love into the workplace. And to know that you know the ego thrives on fragmentation. The ego thrives on fragmentation. I want, the ego wants to compartmentalize and say, you know, you do this now, you do this now, I'm different than this. And it's just constantly fragmenting things instead of unifying and integrating. And one of the precious gifts of a spiritual path is to know that it's all, there's a wholeness, that I can, I can be this, I can bring this love into every aspect of my life, including work. You know, work environments are scary places often because everybody is afraid. They're afraid to be themselves. They're, they're worried about what somebody will think of them. They want to show strength. They want to, you know, there's all this acting going on in, in the workplace. And it's a terrifying place for many of us because we feel like we're in danger all the time and we're going to be judged all the time. Right? And we have to appear a certain way, otherwise we're not going to get the promotion. We're not going to, you know, we, we, there's all this playing going on, right? And a spirit, a genuine spiritual practice teaches us to trust that we can never be better than our authentic selves. Just be authentic and trust and don't be afraid of other people. Don't be afraid of somebody you think has power. You know? Just be there and bring love. And, and I, I was blessed to be able to do that in my workplace. And it, it was remarkable because when you do that, when you can bring authenticity in any part of your life, you and everyone around you unleash your potential. Because if people feel safe, they will do the best that they could ever do. It's fear that limits people's ability to, to do anything. And, and you waste so much energy playing games instead of just, you know, focusing on what's needed right now. And you do that and, and creativity flows and, and teamwork instead of competition and trust and feeling that I'm okay. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to get my head chopped off. You know, I'm, that part of learning is to make mistakes and part of getting better is to make mistakes and to feel safe in that. You know, and all of these things can come to the workplace and they become very effective. And, and and very wonderful, and then and then play, and then work becomes an intimate part of life instead of yeah. you know the, the danger place, the danger environment. But I I only go there because I have to, and I want to run away from it as soon as I. Can. <laughs> yeah. I I really liked when you have. I'm going to repeat this. You have said ego thrives on fragmentation, and I couldn't agree more. I think that's so true. And uh, there is another thing because I also come from, I mean, I work in a corporate setup and uh, spirituality and leadership is big now in corporate world as well, people who have understood. And I did ask uh, one of my managers that what the meditation and these practices are doing to you. And he said, clarity, because my mind feels so much clear, I don't have to believe in anything. And uh, in businesses, especially in startups, it's so cloudy because you have to make so many decisions every day. What do you prioritize? What do you not prioritize? And if your mind is clear, I mean, then um, I think it is easier to prioritize and also let go things that don't work. You know, you just are able to let go. So I quite like that and everything else that you have said as well. Um, uh, of course, I mean, 
you know, part of the of the uh, fantasy of the ego is to say, you know, I can I'll, I don't have time to be spiritual. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> this is another section of my life that I have to set aside time, and I don't have time. You know, it, this is part of the fragmentation. You know, it's just it's just a natural part of being. You know, if I can just be aware of my breath, that's enough. Just being aware of breath keeps us awake, keeps us aware of what, what is now instead of being in my repetitive story of myself you know, and my identifications. So you can make these decisions. One thing that I would like to warn about is that the danger of making spirituality a tool in the self-improvement industry and 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 it becomes how to get rich and famous by being spiritual you know <laughs> and how to get everything you want by being spiritual which is a pitfall you know it's it's not about this you know there's you know, you know spirituality is really about un unlocking the love that is within us and so that we become authentically loving human beings yes. and that changes yeah. everything because yeah. with love with love, everything is possible. Mm, so wonderful. I would almost want to ask you about your opinion about politics, but I'll come to that later on if we have time. But uh, I'm coming to Wasim now. So, um, Wasim, you have witnessed this uh, this whole parallel life, isn't it? Being in the corporate and having a busy life and then also how meditation has helped. So I want to hear from you um, how all these practices have actually helped you to be more productive. Uh, you have touched upon already how you see your colleagues as friends, not as competitors. Um, but are there more things that you'd like to talk about? Because I really want to bring home this point that all of this are really for businesses, are really for people to flourish in their professional lives. So I want to hear all that from you through your experience. Right. Uh, as Mohammed said, so um, if you uh, if you if we use uh, as a tool to become productive, it will be self defeating. Um, <laughs> and it, it is true. It is um, when we sit in meditation it's all about letting go things. And that the ego that I that used to have the strong ego, ego, which keep us all separate and keep us in conflict with one another, those walls started to break loose and things started to open up. Um, so I started meditation five years ago. If I can compare my career, what is five years before and five years after, there's no difference. Uh, so uh, the difference is probably I'm not stressful. I'm not in conflict with my colleagues, uh, with my supplier, with my client. I can, my client, I can understand completely from compassionate point of view, as Mom would say, from the love point of view. My client is also struggling to do something. And how can I, I can see it from more from a human point of view. It's all about the human relationship. It's all about compassion. So. Meditation, it's, it's term is also, um, it's nothing called meditation. I mean, it's, it's just, just sit and observe. And it is not only on the sitting cushion, it it's continues throughout the day. Meditation is, it's not that we have to go to some Himalayas in a cave and do the meditation. Uh, it's a completely wrong notion. And it meditation, I'm talking to you as Reverend Karat says, this is, this is meditation. And, and that when the ego breaks, it's all underlying is compassion, deep compassion and love. And I can see the client where he is struggling. He's really trying to, probably trying to protect his job, probably has a family to feed. Uh, he wants some more money to do something, I don't know. So I am there to help him from completely from compassionate ground. And and in, in my corporate life, that relationship completely changes. All They become my best friend, as I said. And it's a relationship earlier used to be competitions, classes of ego. I am the best, I have to get promotion, it get converted, become compassion. And and during my walk, walk become a, a meditation. Walk is a meditation. When I write an email, I just write the email. 
when I talk to someone, I talk. When I listen to my client or listen to my colleague, I just listen. I don't, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I always try to, or we always try to put ideas when you are, somebody is speaking to me, I will always filter through my ideas. And it's, it's when you see someone without your ideas, you can really, you can listen what they want, what they want. What is his fear? What is his anxiety? They have the same suffering as me. So that whole relationship, when the whole relationship is different, that work is no longer a scary place. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a life. It's a life itself. This work environment is no longer different. So earlier, if I have to work, say, sometime late or sometime this, I find it very stressful. So, but that stress, that idea, when my no, very strong. So I always imagine my day has to be something like this, right? I go with a preconceived day that I have to be best. I have to do this. I have to do this. When I come with a meditative mind or say very open mind and accept everything, so I accept as things as they come, and uh, I still probably still earn the same amount of money. But the earlier it was. I will earn money for me. Uh, I have to get a bigger car, bigger this, bigger house. Um, same at the corporate also, because corporate has to earn more, more profitable. Uh, I do earn, but it's it's not for me. Uh, uh, it's whoever is needed. It's, it's absolutely money it has to go for them. Uh, so that grip of everything is loosened up when, when we sit or not, if, when, when, when we open our hand up top, I would say. Uh, 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 when I let lose our ideas, whole thing is open up. This vastness is open up. And uh, whoever, if, uh, if I have some extra money and somebody doesn't have, and he has uh, that that money has to flow. And I believe if in the corporate, if it be more compassionate ground, uh, it, it's very it, it's a utopian world. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, there will always be self, and there will always be conflict. But if the corporate people started to open up. Uh, and 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 then it will be, probably it will be a very beautiful place to, uh, to live. You know, they 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 will be profit, but profit will go to people um, or society wherever they 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 need it. So so that's that's the way the I, I would see in my work environment. And it, it as I say, when I enter my office, I used to enter my office, I'd be scared. And now when I enter the office, it becomes like a temple. It, oh. it is a temple. Uh, wow. Temple uh, of love or temple with the monastery. It is. Uh, I, I treat it that way. When I press the uh, button, lift, it is. I'm completely aware and pressing a button. So. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. In fact, when you said that this whole productive word is probably, again, you know, probably not the best word to use, but what I really meant was that um, it allows us, like, because you have said that all these negative thoughts that you'd have otherwise years back because you now can get rid of that. So your focus is so much on the work in your hand and that makes it productive not only for you, for the business as well. And I think it's long time now in the 21st century that businesses do understand that um, this kind of productive work that we should be really talking about and also Millennials, they now love environments which are healthy, which are, uh, Mohammed Mahmoud as well said, you know, it has to come out of love, like how you have said suppliers, you understand their problems. I mean, after all, everybody is a human being, isn't it? So it's so wonderful to actually for you guys to share all these experiences. Um, I have got another question for Garrett uh, now. Unless, Wasim, you had anything else to add, did you? No, no, that's fine. Uh, I would I, like to say something about um, the same conflict used to happen in the family with my teenage son, but uh, that also... I, will, I would like to know. I would really like to know right. about that side, so I'll come to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Garrett, a um, lot of people have also said this, um, that their relations, they have manage to improve their relationship uh, either with their partners or with their uh, friends. Uh, so I want to know from you, what would be your advice to improve relationships and let's say with partners, um, how do you see that? 
what is it that you think we need to look at to improve those relations constantly? In fact, like you said, that we are growing every day. So how constantly we do that? Yeah. Well, I think actually listening to uh, the last two, uh, Wazim and Mahud, about talking about work, the business place, it sort of led me to tie that in a little bit, actually, with relationships because it's good not to see everything as a transaction. And I think we can see things as a transaction. We may mean, don't know we're really doing it, but if I do this, you'll do that for me. If I give a bit here, then I'm gonna get a bit back later. Or, you know, if I sort of, yeah, okay, we'll do that. Um, we know inside that it's a transaction, but we don't quite admit it. And I think, life isn't a transaction to give and receive both come from the same place there's an old saying actually that giving and receiving are two folds in the same sleeve i don't know where that came from i, I like it i don't even know if it was made up at some point but it's kind of nice it, it's actually they're so connected that it's if you think of a fold in the sleeve it's all the same material but we tend to we can separate that out as giving to get to receive but the feeling of giving the sense of giving is not separate to that of receiving there's there's gratitude at both times it's, it's pure gratitude that one can give and one gives freely but not with the idea of getting anything back and one receives gratefully and one gives gratefully and I think if we can bring, we can understand that from the relationships of any sort, from that point of view, then I think that's a that's a road, that's a gateway into to looking at it. And um, and but also going back to what I was saying earlier about recognizing that we are tied by our suffering, and. And I'd like to just say a little bit more about cutting those ties, because it is one that's very easily misunderstood in my experience. And it really is giving up your hold on somebody else's life. Now, if you're a parent with a young child, of course, you're responsible for them. Of course, you have to bring them up the best you can. Um, let's not get let's not say that we have to just let our children go and let, and you know that's not what we're talking about i'm talking about um where we see ourselves holding on too tightly to our own idea on behalf of somebody else of what they should be doing and and while that is easy to see um you know where we need to do that with with our children and everything but if one thinks of one's parents um, I found this myself that uh, I realized very quickly after becoming ordained as a monk, actually entering the community, how much <clears throat> that I'd been holding on to my parents' life. That sort of subtle change of thinking that you should be starting to make decisions and you should start to advise them on what they should be doing rather than saying you have a life you live it because i am now moving away from that and when you do that you recognize um that to do to to, to hold on is just creating ongoing suffering so i think with with any sort of relationship whether it's a romantic relationship a business relationship a friend um relationship with oneself is is to recognize when you are holding on to a position and you can't let go of it. And I often talk, and Wazim will heard me talk about this, of the third position, the third position which is no position at all. And if you can find the third position, there's no position that is no position at all, you can go in any direction that is good to do. Because mm -hmm. you're totally not tied to any point of view, any opinion, is totally open to change at any point. And 
And so when we find ourselves in conflict with somebody and we're having an argument with them, it is, it, I think it's good to recognize that one can let go of one's own opinion and allow another opinion to rightfully take its place or to take its place in the world. And you don't have to agree with it. It's just allowing things to be there. And if we can do that in any relationship, it is one of the greatest gifts really that we can give ourselves and others. Um, and so that helps us. Um, it's often said that, you know, spiritual life is for mature adults. And that is part of that maturity that you do not need to fight your corner in a way that is disruptive, um, i.e. I cannot move from this place. To do so is to, I just can't do it. And you don't allow anything else in. Um, but to be able to hold a position, to have a position, listen to an opposing position, and change your position because you're open to hearing what has to be said is a wonderful release. Mm. So any help to anybody in any relationship anywhere, then um, that, that's what I would say really. Yeah, mm. no, no, fantastic, really useful. Um, also, do you kind of feel sometimes that all this, you know, when people are, let's say, fighting over things or gone totally quiet, all they're asking is, I need to be heard, you know, I need to be understood, you know, if, what's the point if you're not getting my point, you know, so do you think it's mostly wanting the person, the partner, whatsoever, whosoever that is, wanting them to be not only physically present, but mentally, emotionally as well, because that's what they're trying to say, aren't they, that hear yeah. me, hear me. We, we all we all want to be heard and and I think that there's there's a need for that um, otherwise we just very slowly um, sort of you know that the, the thing change the, the, the whole relationship thing changes and it can happen so slowly that we don't even know it's happening and suddenly we're with this other person who has just sunk out of sight you know um, I've experienced that in monastic life, you know. Uh, but what I learned was that I still, at any one point, have to let go. There's, in a way, you can't get away, you can't get around that one. There's no argument around that one. Um, to, to move from that position, to release yourself from that suffering, is to let go of the sense of hurt, the sense of not being heard the sense of, um, why don't you ever listen to me? That may indeed be true, but we still have to let go of that hurt that is going to hold on to that. Thing. As soon as we let go of it, mm -hmm. we're immediately liberated to then see what we need to do next. Absolutely. That's my key. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, wonderful. Yeah. Couldn't yeah. agree. Good and agree more. Thank you for that, Garrett. Um, coming to Mahmoud now, um, and Garrett has spoken about this a little bit. Uh, it's to do with parents, and parents, they do worry about their children, mostly during the growing up phase, um, about their future, well-being, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Um, and it can create certain anxiety, stress. Um, so I want to hear from you, what would be your message to parents so that they can reduce some of this stress around children? What would you say? Four children of my own. I have four children of my own. Three of them are adults already and one is still a, a toddler. So, and I've made many mistakes as a parent and I continue to make mistakes as a parent. <laughs> But if, if there's one thing I can, from my heart, share with you and the rest of the audience, is that 
children more than anything else want to know that you love them just as they are often as a parent within we find ourselves in opposition there's a tug between us and our kids because we want them to do certain things and we don't give them the space to just be themselves and of course there are boundaries there's all kinds of important things there's safety all of these things matter but i think we can learn to let a lot a lot of other things go you know especially you know the the pain we can impose on them because we want them to be what we were unable to be ourselves. You know, the, you know, trying to project that on them, wanting them to be better than us, right? We 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 make that noble by saying, "I want you to be better than me," right? Instead of, "I want you to be who you want to be," you know, and I'm with you, I'm on your side, you know, and give them that that for that to be authentic. I don't. I think nothing matters more to a child than knowing that their parent is on their side, especially when they get to be teenagers. When they're going through massive difficulties and change, and you know they're confused, and then if if the if the tension increases because of that, because we're worried about them ruining their lives or you know going in the wrong direction, we, it's often we drive them in that direction because of our own resistance and our own will, trying to impose our will on them. So I, I think just. Re reinforce and let let your child know that you're with them and that you know you love them just because they're here just because they are who they are without condition okay that is so splendid absolutely totally loved it thank you i actually want to ask the same question to wasim as well um because uh, like you Mahmoud, wasim has got also children i think one of them is a uh, is a teenager if i'm not yeah, wrong yeah. <laughs> yeah so how how do you deal with it and have you felt that because of the way you lead your life um uh, has again have a profound impact on how you uh deal with your family with your children so talk to more about that how do you deal with all of that yeah <laughs> absolutely as as I'm afraid, uh, like a parent, I also made many mistakes. Uh, um, I all uh, like like anybody else. I also have a very set ideas how a children should be or what our dream would be. You know, uh, like my children. I grew up on a university campus uh, with uh, lots of intellectual people, so I want my child to be intellectual. Um, a scientist or something like that and this is my very set ideas that's that's how it should be and if it is all all about the ideas and notions i think we see my child through my ideas and that if he doesn't meet to my ideal child i was always a conflict with him and this is i find the most difficult thing to let go and i know i have to let go of that thing uh, the last, I'm sitting, um, opening my hands of thoughts all the time. But this is the when I see when I see him doing something else, um, it comes to my mind. And and when I sit still, I, I sit still when there's a conflict. I try to still myself, and I can see this conflict. And mind is talking. He shouldn't do this. He shouldn't do this. And when I go back, ah, it's my mind is talking. He's fine, but it's just talking mind. He should be like this. He should be like this. And it's letting go and what I want to be is is it difficult? Uh, uh, but I'm still learning to loosen up my hand. As I think the one beautiful Khalil Gibran wrote a very beautiful poem on this. He said, "Children are not my uh, children are not our children. They are the children of life, uh, longing to be alive." So. That's a very beautiful underlying, I think. They're not our children, they're the children of life. And if somebody try to be, a, is, they are all flowers and to try to bloom in their own way. And somebody try to bloom as a rose. Uh, and we say, no, you have to be a jasmine. And if we force them and they will perish. And every, we have to, as a parent, we have to create the environment, the fertile ground for, from where they can bloom as the flower as they are. 
and and I must admit, and this is very difficult uh, as a parent for me to let do whatever they let, like to do. Um, if they don't want to be an <laughs> intellectual and scientist, what would they want to do um, within the boundary of uh, of the society? And uh, they should do. Uh, to, just to, ad to admit, I think uh, uh, with, with the teenage child, because I was from my past or with a very strong ego, I grew, uh, yes, he grew up, he grew up with me with my strong ego. So I'm finding it very difficult to let it go. But my youngest child, who says, seven-year-old i'm just letting him uh, as as he wants and i'm not intervening with him uh, i think i have still some residue for a teenage and and and, and as i said it is it is life and i'm i'm learning and and these things are learning and and as i think Muhammad said earlier it is suffering will will teach you you know as as in buddhist uh, they said uh, there is no mud there's no lotus um, uh, so these are the suffering, and and from the suffering is teaching me uh, how to deal, uh, how to deal with the children who doesn't fit our set notion of ideas. Letting go of ideas is the most difficult thing, I guess. Mm, so what wonderful. Yeah. I th I think I'll remember when you said children of life. I think that's a really good phrase to keep in mind. And also, I think you have almost said that when there is a conflict, rather than looking at what the child is doing, you're actually looking at your thoughts. What are you telling to yourself? I think that probably is one way to look at it, isn't it? Absolutely. I think there's a saying, who said it? I forgot, I, I was uh, writing to for my teenage child. Uh, so um, a clever man, uh, when he was clever, he wanted to change the world. And when he became wise, he, he tried to change himself. Um, so rather than trying to change him, uh, we need to see what conflict is arising within us. And like any other conflict is impermanent, it will pass away. And we just have to still and observe that. And uh, nothing, not to add anything to it or not to take out anything out of it. Let the life be life and just mm -hmm. observe, I think. Ah, that's, 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 that's wonderful. Listen, I have so many questions and of course I'm running out of time. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask all of you one question each, but it will be a quick question and it will be a quick answer so that, you know, I still want to hear from you, but um, we'll have to be make it quicker. So sorry about that. Uh, so Garrett, I want to know from you, everybody has spoken about ego. So for you, um, I think it's easy sometimes to see ego when it's external, when it's material acquisition and all of that. But ego can also be internal, how we internalize our thoughts. How do we know that this is this internal, my inner voice is actually my ego? And more than that, I also want to know lots of questions, not much time, but how ego actually brings us sadness because i don't think so. everybody would know that ego is pretty harmful for us what would be your take let me unmute you oh, sorry i'll start again uh, yeah. Yeah. Sadness, um it separates us out and meditation and the practice that we've all been talking about today is is a matter of as it was said, remembering or rediscovering or realizing what has always been there. And what is always there is the non-separateness of all things. And when we establish a self, and let's not be uh, mistaken here, we will always have a self. We're not trying to get rid of a self. We're just trying to recognizing it that what we create as a permanent self, we need to realize that um the reality of things is that there is no permanence and so when we build as, as it says in buddhism as the buddha said build a house out of the bricks of ego you know we're, we're building it up all the time and so i think the sadness and there, there is indeed a sadness in in establishing and trying to um keep up this permanent self is because we stay separated and that that is an illusion 
And but we do it because we feel that it's the place of safety. And I did this all of my adult life until um, I think we probably nearly every single meditator has discovered this. <laughs> Oh, I was doing that. I didn't realize doing it. And now I can see what's happening. I kept everything at arm's length because I felt if I do that, nothing's going to get anywhere near me and I'll be safe. But all it did was made me recede further and further and further and further back. And um, so I think that's that's what's happening there. And. It's just, as, I, as I've been saying this afternoon, it's just not worrying about it too much. It's just recognizing it when it arises and letting it go. And if you keep doing that, just keep doing that natural, natural, easy action, then one starts to realize that maybe life isn't what we thought it was. Mm, wonderful. So let it go is is a big message today, I think. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so Mehmood, for you, um, what, um, how can we make 2021 happier for ourselves and what should we do every day um, to make ourselves feel better? Oh, I think you'll have to unmute it. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Did you hear my question? Yes, yes, I did. I okay. Did. All right. okay. The, the, I mean, there's no simple recipe answer to this kind of a question. But I, I, I think if we can learn to say yes from an authentic place to our lives, if we can wake up in the morning and let our attention be on all the things that are blessings in our lives that we can be grateful for. We will not be able to get to the end of it because the truth is there is no end to the blessings in our lives. I learned this from a friend of mine who told me just when you're in meditation, visualize, you, this was a practice that I learned from her, Visualize the people that have come in your life who are part of your life that have done something that has helped you. And I tried that and I could never finish this practice. There's always somebody else that appears in my life. And it's it's like I want it's like a mirror, it's a miraculous thing to realize that life is full of so much beauty and so much love. But with you know the ego, as Garrett and and Masina have said, you know the ego tells us we're separate, tries to limit things, tries to focus on what's missing in our lives, what we should have instead of what we have. So if we can live from a place of the place of yes, yes to life, and looking, making our attention beyond how much we have to be grateful for. The things we can be grateful for, the things that are right in our lives, the, the, we will find no end to the abundance and blessings of it. Okay, um, so the message from you is obviously look for the abundance in life, isn't it? So um, I'm going to ask the similar not, not, question. Not just, not just look, but know it, count it. It's in your life. It's, you don't have to go look for it. It's in. It's in. No, our it's, it's there. It's there. Remember, yeah. you know. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Wasim, for you as well. Um, so I want to know how you're going to, you know, change, not change, but, you know, what, what is it that you're going to do in 2021 uh, to keep yourself happy or content? Uh, but more than that, actually, I also wanted to ask you um, about debt, although it sounds like very negative, but and also we are at a time when uh, people are worrying about their health, about their loved ones. You know. So I want to know your views. What, how do you see that as well? And that's how we will end. It's not in a negative way, in a positive way we will end. But yeah, your views, please. Yeah, so very interesting question about debt. Um, what is debt? Uh, I'm not talking about the physical body even dies, but what is actually debt? Debt is sort of meditation. It is letting go of everything. you letting go of everything, every hold you hold. My house, my family, my car, my thing, the, all the things we accumulate in the life, uh, 
we have to let him go. See, example, this house, we think it is my house, but it is an idea. It's not my house. It's an idea that this is my house. I just signed an agreement. It become, this, is, this house belongs to the art. This house belongs to the universe. Nothing mine. At, at the same time, everything is mine. Uh, it is not to my ego. This is not to my individual self. This house and not. These, these all things accumulate is not mine. And, and in death, we have to let go of everything. This is like meditation. And at the same time, as I said, if you look at bigger picture in the deep within us, probably everything, us, we are the universe. Um, we are the made of the stardust. We are made up of billions of years of evolution. Maybe uh, all our parents and ancestors, everything's come with us. We are the universe. So everything at the same time belongs to us. And that is, we have to let go of ego. And uh, I think Jiddu Krishnamurti used to say, to live your life, you have to bring death to your life. You have to let go of everything. Then you can live very happily. It's a very difficult thing to do, uh, letting go of everything. But yes, this is this is what I would see as the death test. Oh, wow. Beautiful. So you almost said that if you have understood death, then you can live your life to the fullest, I suppose. Yeah. Um, because of time, I have to end here. But uh, can I just say that Thank you so much to each one of you, such profound thought. Um, and I think these are discussions that are not usually seen you know, around dining table discussions, but I feel probably these are the sort of discussions which will ultimately take you, take us to peace, happiness, and whatever that is um, for us and for the world. So thank you for your time, best wishes and keep well. And goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. All right. So uh, that brings us to the end of today's show. And I don't think I could have thought of a better panel to start the year um, and set the tone right. You see, like you have heard from all the guests, um, life isn't as serious as the mind makes out to be. And the more we celebrate life, there is more in life to celebrate. So let's just hope that 2021 is a year of celebration for you and for everyone. As always, sending you best wishes for a healthy and a happy life. Keep well, look after yourself, and I'll see you very soon. Goodbye.